we'd like to talk about tonight uh, the Hebrew liturgy, first of all, as we look at Psalm 118, the Hebrew liturgy. A normal Hebrew liturgy adopted from temple worship, but still alive in the synagogue, although modified over the centuries, is called a siddur, a siddur, meaning an order, an order, same basic word almost as a Passover seder, an order, an order of worship, an order of service, an order from the Hebrew infinitive lesser there to set in order, okay? But there's a special kind of liturgy used on holy days. And those are called, uh, that's called a makzor, a makzor. Now in the time of Jesus, there was a siddur and there was a makzor. The siddur com com was comprised of the reading of the Torah and Haft Torah portion of the week. Again, still continued to this day. And it's what Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two are speaking of. The father spoke in many portions and in many ways, that's the portion of the law and the prophets read ritually in an annual lecture. That's part of the Siddur. But there are special readings for holy days in the Maksur. Often these come from, well, they can come from anywhere. There are five major scrolls used in Judaism, but the Psalms come into play in the worship very strongly. Now with the Psalms, we have something called Psalms of Ascent, Psalms of Ascent. The Psalms of Ascent were important for worshiping on the pilgrim feasts, which would be Passover, which would be the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, Hag Shavuot, and which would be the Feast of Tabernacles, Hag Sukkot. And there'd be these massive processions. The pilgrims would come from Israel, Judah, and abroad, and they would organize on the Mount of Olives. And they would have a procession across the Mount of Olives through the East Gate, singing Psalms of Ascent, going up. No matter what direction you approach Jerusalem from, you say going up. I've explained this before. The Israeli airline, El Al, is going up. Aliyah, to immigrate to Israel, is going up. La Alot, to go up. Okay, or to immigrate to Israel, la alot, same word. So you see this used in the liturgy, in, in, in the Psalms of Ascent. Uh, again, forgive my horrific singing voice. My wife again tells me I'm the emasculated parrot, but it's let's go up to Zion, let's go up to Zion, let's go up to Zion, let's go up. Okay, I rejoice when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord, go up, going up, okay? And in these processions through the East Gate, particularly at Passover, and particularly at the Feast of Tabernacles, Levitical choir, the Levitical choir, big, with instrumentation, would lead the procession. And when they got to the choruses, the choruses of the psalm, they knew how close the front of the procession where the Levites were was to the East Gate, the entering before the temple, coming before the Lord. That's how they knew. They would pace the tempo of the music to meet or to coincide with their progress in the procession, how, how much they, they were getting closer. And, that's, and the people knew it. And there'd be this excitement that would be springing up as they were coming before the Lord through the East Gate. Well, anyway, in the time of Jesus and today, the Maxor for two feasts, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, Hag Sukkot, and the Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, Hag Shavuot, uh, are celebrated that way but also Passover. Now in Passover, Hag Pesach, and the last feast, the first one being Passover of the year, as Moses established the year in, in, in the Torah, the first one was Passover. The last feast is Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles. In both the first one and the last one, 
Psalm 115 to 118 is sung liturgically, liturgically, with the climax being Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Give praise to the Lord, for he is good, his mercies endure forever. And this was often sung liturgically in, in Europe with, from the Vulgate in Latin. Benedictum qui veni in nomine dominum. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Of course, Hebrew, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, Baruch nuchem mi bet Adonai, Hodula Adonai kitov, kile olam chazdo. And they'd sing this. And it's still sung today. And it's sung by Jewish believers in Israel. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, Baruch nuchem mi bet Adonai, Hodula Adonai kitov. They, they sing it. It's something goes back thousands of years. Benedictum qui veni in nomine dominum. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it was sung as a greeting twice at Passover and at the Feast of Tabernacles. With one big difference, at the Feast of Tabernacles in the autumn time, following the autumn, in the autumn, with the autumn harvest and so forth, it was sung with something called lulavim, lulavim, palm branches, palm branches. And they were used with some other things in the construction of the roof for the booths in which they celebrated the Feast of Booths and Jews still do. By law, every apartment in Israel must have something called a mir peset, a, a balcony. Every apartment, no matter how small, must have some kind of a mir peset so people can celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So you've got this then, you sing it twice, but at Passover, when people are arriving in Jerusalem for Passover, they were to sing it with their hands waving. At the Feast of Tabernacles, they were to sing it with palm branches, lulavim. Again, we have a teaching on Palm Sunday, with, which if you're familiar with it, you'll know a lot of what I'm going to tell you now. I'm dealing with it mainly from the aspect of the psalm. So something happens. Let's read this psalm, this festal psalm. Let's read 118. It's following 117, which is the psalm of praise. Give thanks to the Lord, he is good. Odula Adonai Kitov, his loving kindness is, is everlasting. Kile Olam Chazdo, all that Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Kile Olam Chazdo. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. In other words, the Levitical priests who'd be leading the choir would sing it first. Oh, let those who fear or reverence the Lord say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Then it goes on. From my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Again, this alludes in part to the crucifixion of Yeshua, of Jesus, that was going to take place at Passover. Okay. We go, but it applies to all of us, of course. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. When scripture reiterates something, when it says the same thing in the same or similar way, two verses consecutively or two times in the same verse. You find that kind of language is often associated with the end of the age, the close of the age. The passage has some kind of what we would popularly call eschatological nuance, okay? But then it continues in verse 10. All nations surround me in the name of the Lord. I will surely cut them off. Gentiles surrounded Jesus, Romans, and so forth. 
but all the nations will come against Jerusalem in the last days, we're told in Zechariah 12. Hence, you have the close of the age nuance or even reference, okay? It continues. They surrounded me, yes, they surrounded me, and the name of the Lord, I'll surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished as a fire of, th uh, as a fire of thorns, and the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. Remember, bees will chase a human up to a quarter of a mile in defense of the queen. The bees will chase a human up to a quarter of a mile in defense of their queen. Now, this relates to other things typological. I don't want to get into it now of, 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 of what it means, but we talk on other recordings of the name Deborah, Devorah, how it means be, and the protection of the queen and so forth relates to the book of Revelation, but I won't go in, into it now. And of course, Jezebel, but I won't go into it now. Forgive me for even bringing it up. Let's continue. Okay. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. And we know that the right hand of the Lord is a metaphor for Jesus, the Messiah. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The Messiah is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he's not given me over to death. Now, of course, this is a general principle, but it speaks about Israel as a nation. The Lord is going to use the time of Jacob's trouble as a instrument of correction to turn them to the right hand of the Lord, which is the Messiah. Okay. Open to me the gates of righteousness. These are figuratively represented by the East Gate, Hashar Harakamim, or the gates of mercy, or the Golden Gate, to which they were going to go through in the procession on the Feast of Booths and on Passover, okay? Then it continues. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I shall give thanks to thee, for thou hast answered me, and thou hast become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We all know the chorus. O Lord, do save. In Hebrew, Hoshana, Hoshana, transliterated to English, Hosanna, Hosanna. O Lord, do save. We beseech thee. Hoshana, Hoshana. We beseech thee. Send prosperity. Look at that. Then it continues in verse 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord, the Lord God, and he has given its light. This refers to the candelabra in the temple, giving out the light of God, representing God's word. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, and you have the huge lamp of, uh, in the corridor, the court of the women, into the holy place. You had the huge candelabras with convex, concave windows. The con con cavity was internal. The convex was external to make it like spotlights. That shining over Jerusalem and over the Kidron would be the word of God represented by the lamps, the fueled by olive oil from the Mount of Olives. Bind the festal sacrifice, festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Again, in verse 27, bind it to the, notice, bind it, fasten it to the horns of the altar. Again, when Yeshua, when Jesus died on the cross, he was the festal sacrifice on the altar. That is the cross. Thou art my God, I give thanks to thee. Thou art my God, I extol thee. Give thanks to the Lord, he is good. 
for his loving kindness is everlasting. Well, that's quite a bit. So that's what was sung twice a year. In preparation for Passover, it was sung in the procession of the pilgrims coming to observe Passover through the East Gate. Okay. And it was in this procession that Jesus came riding, of course, on a white donkey. Now let's understand that right away. Most of you have heard this, I think. The two pictures of the Messiah, the suffering servant and the conquering king, the son of Joseph, the son of David, Hamashiach ben Yosef, Hamashiach ben David. The first time he comes is as the suffering servant. The second time it's as the conquering king. The Hebrews of that time did not know the difference. Even John the Baptist couldn't understand it, sent his disciples to question Jesus. The apostles didn't understand it, even after the resurrection. Jesus had to explain it to them, even on the Mount of Olives at the time of the ascension. That is, one Messiah, two comings. In his first coming, he comes, look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now we have a teaching where we explain the typology of the donkey and why Jesus came on it. It's called Pideon Haben, Pideon Hab. Pideon Haben, the uh, about the firstborn. Okay, the, 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 you can find it on the Moriel website. Okay, and the Pideon Haben of, of of the firstborn. Okay, the redemption of the firstborn. Um, well, that's his first coming. Let's look at his second coming. Of course, we know this in the Book of Revelation. Chapter 19. After these things, I heard, as it were, a loud voice of great multitude. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Salvation belongs to our God. And we see all the people in heaven rejoicing, the 24 elders in heaven, because something was going to transpire on earth, okay? As we continue in this chapter, we see the picture of the Messiah coming. And he comes riding on a white horse, riding on a white horse. And we're told, and on his robes and on his thigh was the name King of Kings. In verse 16, in verse 16, in verse 11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat upon it was called faithful. Now, the Jews of Jesus day, as most of you know, were expecting a Messiah who would set up the millennial kingdom, who would fulfill the prophecies of Zechariah 14 who would fulfill the Feast of Booths and establish the Millennial Kingdom, represented by the Feast of Booths and Zechariah 14, when the nations would come to Jerusalem at the Feast of Booths to worship God. That's what they were expecting. Somebody who would get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks. On the north side of the Temple Mount, that would have been to the right of Jesus as he came through the East Gate. There was the Fortress Antonio pagan Roman fortress with its phoenixes and symbols towering over the house of God. It represented not only a military occupation, but a subjugation of their faith by pagan Roman religion. 
and they thought the Messiah was going to come, make the right turn, and get rid of the Romans, the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks. As long as Jesus was going to fulfill their expectation, they were happy to sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They thought this was something that fulfilled Zechariah 14, the Feast of Booths, when you sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, waving the palm branches, the lulavim. Okay. But when he enters the East Gate, as you heard me say, instead of making the right turn and getting rid of the Romans, he makes a left turn into the Solomon's portico. And instead of getting rid of the Romans in the Fortress Antonio, he goes into Solomon's portico area and he gets rid of Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and Joyce Meyer. Now everybody freaks out. That's not what they expected. God being more concerned with the sin among his own people, particularly those who are profiteering on the blood of the lamb, profiteering on the gospel, profiteering on salvation. He's much more concerned with that than he is with the pagan Romans. He deals with the world, the nations, in his second coming. He dealt with his own people in his first coming. He didn't meet their expectation. They thought he was coming on a white horse. They forgot about what Zachariah said. He was coming on a donkey as a humble servant the first time. Now, again, it's an aside. I just mentioned it. Well, I don't, I don't want to digress, but you see the Antichrist in Revelation 6 coming on a white horse. He's not only counterfeiting what Christ is going to do in Revelation 19, he is doing what the Hebrews wanted Christ to do on Palm Sunday when they arrived in Jerusalem for Passover. He's going to give them what they wanted. Yeshua, Jesus, didn't give them what they wanted. Jesus gave them what they needed, the way of salvation. The Antichrist is going to come and pretend to give them what they want. That is going to be the key of his popularity. He'll bring a false peace and a false prosperity, etc. Again, we have other tapes explaining this. I would point you to our teaching on Palm Sunday if you're not familiar with it. But we see something here with the palm. They begin to celebrate Passover as if it were the Feast of Tabernacles, booths, the millennium of Zechariah 14 and Revelation 20. This is seen even earlier at the Transfiguration. When Jesus is transfigured with Moses and Elijah, Peter, James, and John thought the Messianic kingdom had come. They thought it was the millennium. So Peter says, do you want me to build three booths? They thought the kingdom had come. One of the most ridiculous, absurd, nonsense things in the history of Christianity, or Christendom, perhaps better put, is the ludicrous abs absurdity of Palm Sunday. When you see these churches, or so-called churches, giving people palm on Palm Sunday, they're commemorating a mistake. They weren't to worship the Lord with palm at Passover. They were to worship the Lord with palm when he returns at the Feast of Weeks to establish his messianic kingdom. Now, this is after the rapture. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Revelation, chapter 7, for a brief moment, please. Verse 9, 
After these things, I looked and behold a multitude which no one could count. Every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hand. They're getting ready to come back with Jesus after the wrath of God and establish the messianic kingdom to fulfill the feast of weeks, to fulfill the prophecies of Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, we have new people. Perhaps we should just look very briefly at, at a small portion. I promise I won't bore you too much of Zechariah 14. Verse 16. It will come about any who are left of the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to celebrate the Feast of Booths, Hag Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, no rain will fall upon them, etc. In verse 18, the Lord will smite those nations that do not go up to worship at the Feast of Booths. This is a picture of what's going to happen when the nations worship Jesus during the millennial reign. But the Hebrews of his time thought that was it. They didn't understand one Messiah, two comings, and the rabbis still don't. Separate, sub related, but separate subject that we've talked about before. I would additionally point you to our recorded teaching, One Messiah, Two Comings. So, they had what we would in modern terms call an over-realized eschatology. That's what theologians would call it. A more popular expression of it is dominionism, triumphalism, kingdom now theology, the latter day reign, the man-child, this notion that began with, well, it had expressions earlier in history, but in the 20th century, it began by people influenced by crazy people, by William Branham and other people like this, that the church was going to be triumphant and conquer the world for Christ before he comes. Romans 16 tells us that the Lord will come and trample Satan under your feet. They said, no, we will trample Satan. Dominion, kingdom now theology, triumphalism. This was the restoration movement in England. And many of its tenets are today incorporated, are incorporated into the new apostolic reformation. It was the false doctrine of Mike Bickle and, uh, and the Kansas City with the false prophets and other people like this who made wild predictions in the name of the Lord of triumphalism that failed to happen. Again, we have no shortage of other recorded material documenting and explaining these things. So they wanted a Messiah who was going to set up the kingdom now. Kingdom now. They were restorationists. They were triumphalists. Now is the time for us to march upon the land. We're building a kingdom. They would fit right in with the, these people who believe this this stuff. Well, let's look further. They also sang, give us prosperity now. They wanted to be rich now or then. Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. When he comes back, the faithful believers will be the aristocracy. The meek will inherit the earth. Don't worry. Every Christian who's a faithful Christian is an heir. It doesn't matter if you've got $10 million in the bank or 10 million pounds in the bank or $10 in the bank. 
It doesn't matter how much or how little you have. His kingdom is not of this world and the riches are not of this fallen world. That's not to say they are not in part of the earth, but they're not of the fallen world. Every Christian is both flat broke and incredibly wealthy. We're flat broke in that anything we have materially or financially belongs to Jesus. Every one of us is flat broke. No matter how many figures they have in their bank book, every truly saved Christian is flat broke. They're only a steward of what belongs to the Lord. And every Christian is an heir to an unfathomable fortune. Every Christian is unbelievably rich. Every one of us is broke and every one of us is rich. He's coming. Now we've had all kinds of lies of Satan, even in the political realm, socialism and Marxism, trying to build the millennium on earth. These are lies of the devil. The dominion theology of the apostate church this is the lies of the devil. We have to trust in him and his kingdom. But they want to wave the palm branches. Say, God wants you rich. You're a king's kid. Name it and claim it. Hallelujah. Blab it and grab it. You've heard me rail against these things for years. You know it as well as I do. Because you've heard me and other people point to it so many times. Do give us prosperity now, they said in the Hallel Rabbah when they sang it. Set up the kingdom. And the third was they wanted to see him do these incredible miracles they had heard about. They forgot about that he said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. They forget about that when he healed people, he would say things like, Shh, that's between us. Keep it to yourself. He never allowed miracles, healings, signs, wonders to be the focus of his ministry or his message. These signs follow. This is not to deny the reality of miracles, but it is to deny that the miracle crusades we see today are scriptural in their emphasis or theology, they are not. Had Jesus put on a show for Herod, he could have saved his neck. He wouldn't have crucified him. But he didn't do that. No, the way that Satan rendered the Jews, the Hebrews, unprepared for Jesus' first coming was through prosperity theology, through kingdom now dominion theology, and through a signs and wonders theology, the Sim Vanifla Oat. That's how he bamboozled the Jews into not being ready for his first coming. And it is how Satan is bamboozling so many Christians today, be it the dominionists, the restorationists of Britain, be it the New Apostolic Reformation, be it the word faith, they're all aspects of the same deception. Yes, these things will happen when we have the palm branches. Right now, there's no palm branches. The palm branches show up in the book of Revelation chapter 7. It's always been amazing to me. The way I've always put it is they had the right Messiah, but they had the wrong Messiah. They said the right thing, but they said the wrong thing. They did the right thing, but they did the wrong thing. They understood about Jesus, but they had them all wrong. Well, that is the Jews of the Second Temple period. That is the Jews of the first century. And it is much of the church of the 21st century. Now let's understand 
how this psalm plays out. You've heard me point out innumerable times that the more times something is in scripture, the more important it is. If it's in there once, it's important. If it's in there twice, it's more important. If it's in there three times, it's more important still. If it's in there four times, it's unbelievably important. And if it's in both testaments, put an asterisk next to it, it goes through the roof of its importance. Obviously, it's in the Old Testament. It's in both testaments. It's in Psalm 118. But it is in all four Gospels. It's in all four Gospels. Only very, very absolutely fundamental things are in all four Gospels. Matthew will have stuff different than Luke. Luke will have stuff different than Mark. They'll all have stuff different than John. There's a compendium. You've got to read them in light of each other. But, but the citation of this psalm is found in all four gospel accounts leading up to the passion narrative. Let's begin with Matthew. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. And when they'd approached Jerusalem and come from Beth Page, Beth Page is on the Mount of Olives. To the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. Go to the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Again, I deal with the typology of the donkeys and the colt in the Pideon Haben, okay, where you have the donkey that had, had to have its neck broken. It's, I, I couldn't begin to go into it now for the sake of brevity and time, but I point you to the teaching. It's important to understand about the donkeys and the donkeys are on that teaching. If anyone says something to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them and immediately he'll send them. Now this took place and what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold your king's coming to you, gentle, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. This is from the Septuagint version of Zechariah 9.9 that we read. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them and bought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments on which he rode and most of the multitude spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the multitude going before him and those who followed were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, just like when he was born in the nativity narrative. The angels, the angelic choir, and when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who's this? And the multitudes were saying, This is the prophet Yeshua from Nazareth in Galilee. Hoshana la ben David. They were saying, Hosanna to the son of David, expecting that the Messiah would restore the throne of David, lost with the Babylonian captivity, and establish the millennial kingdom and the character of David's reign. That's what they thought. Hosanna to the son of David. They should have been saying, Hosanna to the son of Joseph. He's not on the white horse. He's on a donkey. He's not in a limousine. He's on a bicycle. 
his second coming is his second. Then he enters the temple. He casts out those who are buying and selling in the temple, overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who are selling doves. That's a poor person's offering. Now notice, those were a poor person's offering. One of the things you will find with word faith money preachers is a lot of the people they milk and rip off are poor people, are poor people, or people of lower socioeconomic position. Those are the ones who tend to flock to, to arenas to hear these con artists because they're buying into a false hope that they're going to become upwardly mobile and affluent. I've seen Mara Cirillo do this. They all do this. They appeal to the less privileged economically, and that's who they exploit. <clears throat> I knew one of these con artists, this one from America, came to England to open an office, and someone from our ministry went to it, and he was giving his whole speech about how Jesus was rich and his family was rich, and God wants you rich. And so this sister from the Lord of, in the Lord asked him at, during the question time, then how come if his family was rich, Mary bought a turtle dove? She bought a poor person's offering instead of a rich person's offering. And of course, they ushered her out immediately. This was John Avanzini. What unbelievable sleaze. You know, th these money preachers could give lessons in sleaze to Joe Biden, uh, uh, not to be too political. They, they're sleazier than politicians. They have no integrity. Selling doves. It said, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. And the blind and lame came to the temple and he healed them, okay. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he'd done, and the children who were crying, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said, yes, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, thou hast prepared praise for thyself. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. That is Matthew. Remember, it's easier for children to get saved than adults as long as they're old enough to understand the gospel. Turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 11. He comes to Jerusalem in verse 15, and he begins to cast out those who are buying and selling in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling Doves, again, ripping off the poor, and he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. And he began to teach and say, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. And the chief priests and scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. Oh boy. He was a threat to their position and power. Whenever evening came, they'd go out of the city. The story continues. Let's look at Luke's version. Luke Chapter 19, verse 28. After he said these things, he was going on ahead, ascending, notice going up, some of ascent, to Jerusalem. And it came about when he approached Bethpage and Bethany, he used to stay at Bethany, at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, near the mount that's called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples. Go to the village opposite, you will enter, find the cult on which no one has ever rode. That's important. I refer you again to Pideon Haben. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? 
Thus you shall say the Lord has need of it. And those who were sent went away and found it as he had told them, and they were untying the colt. And its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. Well, the story continues. In verse 37, as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, he's now on the western slope of the Mount of Olives going down towards the Kidron to cross it towards Jerusalem. In fact, in his day, the Romans had built a kind of arch bridge. The whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully, and they sang Psalm 118. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That sounds just like the nativity narrative, doesn't it? He's going to fulfill what was promised at his birth. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. As most of you know, 1 Peter 2.5, we are the stones of the temple. The church is the oikos hegios, the holy house. We are the temple now. That is, the church is the temple, and we are the stones of it. When the Pharisees came to hear John the Baptist, John told them, God could raise up Abraham's children out of the stones. If these don't proclaim me, the stones will cry out. In other words, if Israel doesn't proclaim him to be the Messiah, the church will, Christians will, believers will. Then he talks about this in verse 43, the days will come when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground. <clears throat> he says, this temple is going to be destroyed. There's going to be a different temple that Satan can't destroy. Upon this rock, I'll build my house. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You are trusting in this temple. There's a temple that's coming and the stones of it will cry out and proclaim me. We are the living stones. But there it is again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Turn with me finally to John chapter 12. Verse 12, on the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, and began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. And again, it quotes Zechariah 9 9. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that he had done these things and that they had done these things to him. And so the multitude who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him up from the dead, were bearing witness to him. For this cause also the multitude went and met him because they heard he had performed this sign. And the Pharisees therefore said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. The Hebrews knew from Psalms, from Job chapter 19, 
and from Daniel chapter 12, that the Messiah would raise the dead. Hence, the story of Jesus raising the dead with Lazarus became popularly known. He did it elsewhere in Galilee, but now he did it near Jerusalem. That reinforced their belief he was the Messiah. And he was the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But they wanted him to be king. Well, he was king. Pilate called him king of the Jews. And by allowing the people to proclaim him as king, he gave ammunition almost for the Sanhedrin to accuse him of sedition to the Roman authorities. We have no king but Caesar. They hated Caesar, but they hated their Messiah more. This was the religious leadership. Well, this same kind of corruption and hypocrisy, even treachery, we see in the Sanhedrin. <laughs> That's always existed. It, it exists in the World Council of Churches today. It is not peculiar to the Jews. It's just that we have a scriptural example. So it is. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And quoting from Psalm 118, he says, the building block that was rejected, the Messiah, became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The term building block in Hebrew, on the underlying Aramaic and, and from Hebrew, is Rosh Pina, Rosh Pina, the head of the corner. It is not the dedication stone of a building as we would have it with the date of its dedication embossed into the concrete or whatever. No, the Rosh Pina was the central stone of an arch, of a stone arch that held the other stones in tension and in place. If you took out the Rosh Pina, the arch would collapse. The Romans understood from a point of view of engineering, the strength and durability of an arch. There is to this day a small bridge over a gorge in Switzerland that you can drive an automobile over built by the Romans, an arch bridge. Incredible. I've seen Roman structures in Rome, in Italy, in Israel, arch construction. The Rosh Pina holds the rest of the stones in position, and it can support tremendous weight and can be durable for centuries, ad infinitum. But if you take the Rosh Pina out, the keystone, as some people would call it, if you remove the Rosh Pina, the rest of it just collapses. That's the way it is with us. If Jesus, Yeshua, is the Rosh Pina, if he is at the center, the church has tremendous strength and endurance. You take him out of it, the church collapses. The building block, the corner, the building block that was rejected has become the cornerstone of a whole new world. He said, This temple is going. I'm building a new temple, and I'm going to be the cornerstone, and it's going to survive. Yours is going to be destroyed in 70 AD, as Daniel predicted. And it was. Just as Jesus said, and as Daniel, of course prophesied. And so it was. Incredible. You're talking now of tens of thousands of people, upwards of 100,000, 
pilgrims coming across, a lot of people in those days, coming down the Mount of Olives, crossing the Kidron, going through the East Gate, singing Psalm 118. The climax of it, as they came before the temple, the house of the Lord, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the singing is to Jesus as he comes through the East Gate, riding on the donkey, waving the palm branches, waiting for him to get rid of the Romans, waiting for him to raise all the dead. But he had another agenda. He came first to deal with sin. He came first to deal with the unrighteousness of the nation. He came to deal with my iniquity and yours. He came on the donkey, not the horse. But when he comes back, it'll surely be on the horse, so to speak. And then we will sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Unfortunately, in a last-ditch effort, Satan will pull the same stunt and try to counterfeit it with Antichrist, who comes on a white horse. In Revelation chapter 6. We know that. But ultimately... That's not what matters. What matters is what Jesus said matters. The Hallel Rabbah, the great praise. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The building block that was rejected became the cornerstone of a whole new world. If these don't proclaim me, the stones will cry out, even from the mouth of infants. This is Psalm 118. Lord willing, we'll continue with the final psalm in our present series next week with Psalm 133. Uh, but I'd like you during the week to be thinking and praying about what book you'd like to go into next. Uh, bearing in mind, we have a lot of young believers and some books might be too complicated for the newly saved people. I wouldn't want to do revelation or something with, with as many new believers as we have now. There's a time, of course, and a, and a place to do revelation or, or these other deeper books. We want to make it something that is for everyone, something that would be to the edification of older believers and something that could be understood and be for the edification of newly saved people. We have to appeal to a wide listenership. Uh, that's just common sense. But please think about it, pray about it. Let us know what you think. We will be doing this next week, okay? Thank you so very much for listening and God bless.